go. Do the count, okay. Hello, this is Stacy Mollett, Executive Director of the North Carolina Center for Health and Wellness, anchored here at the University of North Carolina Asheville. I am thrilled to welcome you to the live stream of the keynote address for the National Physical Standing Education. Standing up, Institute. yelling, screaming. Enjoy. Go. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, we would like to thank all of you in the audience here live and those of you that are watching this on video all around the world. Welcome to the afternoon session with uh, Andy Vasley. Uh, Andy's come all the way from China, but before Andy, I have a very special person to introduce to you, Lee Speaker. Would you come up here, Lee? Lee, one of you, one of you, will be the lucky winner of a $4,000 plus rail yard fitness unit. And I just want, is it you? <laughs> uh, how we're gonna do this at the very end, last closing keynote, which will be Joey Fight. You're gonna take your little name tag, you're gonna stick it in the box, and we're gonna swirl it all around. We'll pick one, be the lucky winner. So I just wanted Lee to uh, introduce himself He's been a very, very hmm, trustworthy supporter of the National PE Institute. Lee Speaker from Rail Yard Fitness. Thank you. Lee. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, Artie for allowing me to participate in this. Uh, the, since we started coming to this, I have to say this is the most engaged crowd. Uh, in attendance of any of the workshops, and I've done hundreds of these on three continents. And this is the crowd that is most interested in the kids that they work with. So big congratulations to all of you. So we're looking forward to uh, providing this course to somebody. It'll be one of our most popular courses. It values uh, 42, with freight about $4,700. And uh, to look forward to once I ship it to you, hearing back from you as to what you've done with it. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much. Andy Vasley. Well, what? Oh, excuse me, <laughs> Alex. Hey, this is the second time I've done this. I, I apologize. Take it away, Alex. National PE Institute, and with Focus Fitness, I'm Alex O'Brien. The question of the day today is, what has been your biggest takeaway from the PE Institute this year? Let's go straight to the experts for the answer. All right, biggest takeaway so far in this meeting has been putting it all together and how to assess teachers, how to bring the technology in, and then keeping kids physical active to K-12. The uh, professional educators that I've gotten to meet and the uh, learning networks that are going to continue many, many days beyond being here at the conference. This conference has been awesome. I feel as though um, leaving this conference, I'll be able to take away with me invaluable resources that I can connect with all these wonderful people that I've been meeting um, and continue this conversation of quality physical education for, for our students and, and, and for the well-being of, of you know, everyone that we meet. Uh, my biggest takeaway so far has been some adaptive PE equipment that we made this morning in the Make It Take It session. So, takeaway so far, Neela still was talking about visualization and how to use it with teaching and how I can use that personal life and with my kids and teach them that and it's just going to improve so many things this year. The biggest takeaway for me, uh, consistent collaboration and improvement with just some very tremendous teachers. 
All right, biggest takeaway is the connections you made with other people. Biggest takeaway from the convention would have to be collaborating with others like the classroom teachers get to do in the school. We get to do that here with all these awesome superstar PE teachers, so I love it. Uh, the biggest thing I'm taking away is just change. Even if it's a little tweak in what you do, change it and make it better for your kids. My biggest takeaway is just learning about everything and changing the way I do things and making it more exciting. Biggest thing for me is just learn the new things and trying to take the new things back with me for sharing everything. I am most impressed with how all of our speakers lean on each other and tell us how they have learned from each other over the years. So the biggest takeaway so far these past three days is just a sense of community uh, within the physical education world. So much love and it's awesome. Networking. It's all about networking. Collaborating with other professionals to learn to make an impact on our students when we go back. I love it. Biggest takeaway. I'm a first year teacher. Just the connections that I've met, the ideas that I've saw. Uh, it's just overwhelming and I love it. I need more. Uh, biggest takeaway from keynote this morning, I think, is just for us as phys ed teachers to be aware of how the world sees us and be able to advocate for why the world needs us to become a better place. Biggest takeaway from the conference is learning from all of you. We learn best from our colleagues. Uh, my biggest takeaway is just one, been meeting new people, new ideas, and I think just different strategies from you know around the world, even internationally, and it's just been great. So my biggest takeaway so far from this year is just implementing new classroom ideas and being able to uh, have the attention of my students and just command that uh, attention to allow them to learn and just get them into a group setting quickly. All right, two takeaways. First, Andy Vasily, you have to personally connect your content with the children. Second, Dr. Ash Casey, hidden curriculum. What you're not teaching is actually what you're teaching. This conference has been great and uh, definitely all the technology advice and um, could have used Voxer and stay connected with all the other physical educators. Biggest takeaway so far I've gotten is uh, how to incorporate different health concepts in physical activity without taking away the physical activity times. My biggest takeaway from the PE Institute is seeing people that are twice my age, legit running around like crazy and have way more energy than I do and it makes me want to get active because I just can't believe that they're out there doing things that five-year-olds are doing and they have to keep up with that and it's really impressive and it makes me want to get active. Uh, I've taken away most that uh, we're all a family and that uh, we all can gain things from each other and we all have strengths and weaknesses and um, just learn such a great deal. My biggest takeaway is just all the amazing learning that's taken place and all the, the presenters with the side conversations and just uh, just all the connections I've made so far and just things going on around the world are just uh, incredible, including Voxer. My biggest takeaway from this conference is this dude right here. His uh, energy and enthusiasm is infectious. My biggest takeaway from this conference is that how passionate the PE teachers are because when I was in high school, they didn't really care, so <laughs> it's just refreshing to see that how passionate these PE teachers are about the kids and their health. The best part about this conference has been connections and building that community because community is important. It's everything. Got to make those connections, right? Uh, what I've taken away from the conference thus far is if we are, if our students are hiring personal trainers and dietitians, then we're not doing our job. I love it. Thank you. My favorite thing in the conference conference so far is having the nutrition card relay race. I love that. It's nice. so exciting. Nutrition and PE together, it's perfect. My biggest takeaway from this conference is the use of social media and feeling more comfortable with it. Um, my biggest takeaway from this conference is being the person to get others connected with social media. Um, it's amazing what people don't know about this and how it's um, so big, but yet I get to teach people about it. So I like that. I think my biggest takeaway is that technology can really be used in the classroom a lot more than um, I ever dreamed it could be. Ow! Two claps on a Ric Flair. <laughs> gotta love it. A lot of great takeaways already, and we still got a day left. Let's turn it back over to you, Artie. Wow, that's amazing, Alex. Done good, done good. Let's give him a hand. Those are, those are. Y'all don't know the difference between a hand and a clap. If I said to you, give yourselves one clap, what would you do? Give yourselves a clap. Give yourselves a hand. 
Give yourself two claps. Give yourselves two hands. Give yourselves three claps. Give yourself three hands. They all add up. Woo, okay. But thank you, Alex. That's wonderful. Those of you that are currently on Twitter now, because you might have a device in your hand, I've been requested. If you would please type in hashtag PE Institute 15. If you type in hashtag PE Institute 15, then we'll be able to see all the folks that are connected on Twitter. Hashtag PE Institute 15. Now, it is my privilege and honor to uh, introduce Andy Vasley. Um, I don't know, there must be a common theme. You must know a lot of people, Andy. There, there appears to be a common thing, a common thread amongst all of our keynoters so far. They always seem to mention this one person. Uh, Cameo. No, this one person, <laughs> Andy Vasley from China. So here he is, Andy Vasley. If you give him a big round of applause. You don't need, you don't need this. Let's turn this off. Excuse me, excuse me, sir. Okay, hopefully that'll work. Can you hear me? Loud and clear? Okay, it's an honor to be here. Whenever I present and lead workshops, there's a video that I love to share. It's kind of humorous in its own way. But embedded within the Cliff Young story is a very important message about what it means to be a teacher. However, Cliff Young was not a teacher. He was a 61-year-old potato farmer from Australia. Now, I don't blame you if you're asking yourself, what can a 61-year-old potato farmer from Australia teach me about teaching? I know everything about teaching. Well, let's watch the video and find out. At 19, now, when I say elite sportsman, you automatically think of a 61-year-old potato farmer wearing gumboots, don't you? Sometimes you have events that sort of uh, tickle a nation's funny bone or something grabs their attention. And with Cliff Young, it sort of, it appealed to us on so many different levels. And he used to run in gumboots. He was the worst dressed sports person we've ever had. These days, of course, you know, Nike would have been there getting very special slick gumboots. Cliff Young was, as his name suggested, young at heart. He embodied the never-say-die attitude many aspire to, but few achieve. What the interesting thing about Cliff Young is, is that he wanted to do it. And it was remarkable what he did. I mean, he didn't cheat. He actually did it. Oh, it's been a really tough run. The hills all the way. To here, anyway. And day after day, Cliff Young, the Cliff Young shuffle, and the whole nation fell in love with him. Incredibly, at age 61, Cliff became the oldest marathon winner and he took two days off the previous Sydney to Melbourne race record. Do you think that you're going to make it all the way? Oh, yeah, for sure. I'm going to run all night tonight and I hope to finish tomorrow. Tomorrow night sometime. And he screeded the field. He just ripped them wide open. Kept going to Melbourne. If they hadn't stopped him, he would have finished in Perth. Cliff was awarded the first prize of $10,000. He promptly gave two grand to each of the five other runners and kept nothing for himself. An impressive and generous man, that Cliff. Cliff, would you do it again? Would you do it again? Oh, no, I don't think so. I love that story and I love that video. What they didn't tell you in the video was that Cliff Young ran 875 kilometers over five days. 875 kilometers. So now I've got a little math challenge for my American friends in the audience, okay? And the, the winner, or the first person to shout out the answer to this question gets a personally autog autographed Artie Camia PE Institute football. Okay, the question is, how many kilometers are in a mile? Joe McCarthy. There you go. 
Yes, 1.6 kilometers in a mile. That means that Cliff Young ran 546.8 miles. Okay, second giveaway. Same prize. How many marathons is that? 21. <laughs> She's very good at mental maths. There you go, Patty. When Cliff Young showed up to run the race, when he showed up to uh, run the race, some people actually said, old man, you're going to die. This is one of the hardest marathons in the world, one of the hardest races on the planet. Um, at that point, he was asked, have, do you have any run, uh, race experience? And he admitted that he had none. He had never run a marathon, a half marathon, a 5K, or a 10K. But somehow he managed to talk himself into the race, and the rest is history. Cliff Young didn't run the race to win rewards and fame, and he certainly didn't do it for the money either. He gave away the, the $10,000 first place prize. He clearly did it for the love of running and the pursuit of excellence. And to me, this is what good teaching is all about, the pursuit of excellence both personally and professionally. The Cliff Young story embodies and sums up exactly what it means to be a teacher over a career or really at any point during a teacher's career. And it's about always moving forward, making those small micro improvements to our teaching with regularity over time. It's not about crazy leaps and bounds, nor is it about three steps forward and one step back. I truly don't believe in any steps backwards when it comes to our teaching. It's about always moving forward and improving upon our craft. The National PE Institute and conferences such as this always help to ignite our flames of motivation. And we often leave these conferences feeling a sense of excitement, really wanting to put new ideas and strategies into our teaching practice when we get back to our schools. We have every intention to create change and, and transform our practice. But again, what oftentimes happens is that slowly and surely over time, those brightly burning flames of motivation begin to fizzle out and we return back to our old ways of teaching. And I'm not implying that our old ways of teaching are bad. I believe we're doing really good things. But I would argue that continuing to move forward and grow professionally requires us to continually change and transform our practice. And along the way, it's imperative to find the inspiration to keep our flames of motivation burning and fueling us forward in our own pursuit of excellence. My own pursuit of excellence in education has lasted, spanned two decades now. And my biggest takeaway at this point is that, and it's been through a whole spectrum of ups and downs and, and obstacles and, and failures, that I've come to the conclusion that good teaching or success in teaching is not defined by vertical columns or checked boxes or great test results. But as educators, we're constantly bombarded with messages from above that good teaching is about producing results. And to me, this is very much a product is everything type of mentality. And I know many of you in the auditorium here have experiences in sport and education that have placed great value and focus on product and very little emphasis on process. And the research has conclusively shown that when our self-worth and self-identity is too closely connected to product or end result, that in the face of failure, defeat, and obstacles, our self-worth and self-identity can be flattened and our confidence crushed. And I believe it's very important as educators to, to flip this thinking, not only in our own best interest, but also the best interest of our students. It's very important to get them to understand that they are unique individuals and they're all on distinctly di different and unique learning journeys. And these journeys must be rooted in the process of learning. Regardless of who we are, a teacher, a student, or an athlete, mastery is a mindset. And I believe that we need to, to take every opportunity possible to use failure and mistakes as a springboard to catapult us forward in life in school, in sport, or any other endeavor that we pursue. And for this mastery mindset to flourish, process must always trump product. And in making this happen, 
quality specific and meaning feedback needs to be a part of that process. At the very heart of good teaching is the ability to accept criticism and feedback about our own teaching practice. And I know how hard it is. And I know that as educators, we're often so caught up in our own headspace that it's really difficult to accept feedback. But depersonalizing criticism and feedback is an essential skill necessary to elevate our teaching. I truly believe that. Master teachers are not experts because they take a subject to its conceptual end. They're masters because they know there isn't one. And it's my firm belief that mastery in teaching is about absolutely loving the journey and process of learning, regardless of at whatever point in your career you are at. It's imperative to mentor and be mentored through the process. Stanford professor Carol Dweck sums it up perfectly in her best-selling book, Mindset, A New Psychology of Success, when she says, becoming is better than being. Very important to think about as we move forward with our teaching. Another aspect of good teaching is about taking initiative to learn and grow. And I know many of you here have taken initiative and action to create your own autonomous learning journeys in education. I know some of you have paid out, out of your own pocket to be here, and collectively, we've all taken our summer vacation to be here, which is a clear indicator of our commitment to this profession. And with the advent of social media over the last few years, creating our own autonomous learning journeys in education has never been more possible for us. Whether it be through Facebook, Twitter, or Voxer, great minds in our industry are coming together to learn from one another, to grow, to share, and to connect. Social media is truly helping to transform and revolutionize our teaching practice. And we all have equal access to these platforms. So creating our own autonomous learning journeys in education has never been more possible to us. And no longer are schools or school districts solely responsible for professional, uh, professionally developing us. I think that being a socially connected educator is about pushing our boundaries and our comfort zones and propelling us onward and upward with our teaching. However, these platforms are not just about connecting and giving each other a collective pat on the back. They're about so much more than that. And they're about opening up dialogue and discourse that will challenge us to pedagogically justify why we do what we do with our practice. And in saying this, uh, what I mentioned before about mentoring, it would be unfair to not recognize all of the great minds and organizations devoted to excellence in our subject area that came before the advent of social media. I think that they've, we owe them tremendous gratitude because they've helped to pave the way for all of us. And I don't even want to begin listing off people or organizations for fear of leaving somebody off, but as I look out, I see some of you here today. There's a man right there beside Joey. Um, I want you to do me a favor right now, okay? So consider this kind of like your seventh inning stretch time. If becoming a socially connected educator by using any of these platforms here has helped to transform, deepen your practice, or make you better at what you do, please stand. Now, I want to ask the people that do not consider the, themselves socially connected educators to also stand. Come on, everybody, that means everybody here. We're all educators, let's go. And we're, I'm saying this because you are just, a much, uh, just as much a part of this professional network as socially connected educators. And you don't need to be socially connected to achieve greatness in teaching. Now, I need you to remain standing. Let's do a little stretch. I need you to remain standing as I tell you about the best teacher that I've ever worked with. Her name is Marina Geisen, and she's from Saskatchewan, Canada, Hartle, Hartle's hometown. Uh, Neela and I have had the pleasure of working with Marina for the last four years in Nanjing, China. We also feel blessed to have had her as Eli, our son Eli's grade four teacher a couple years ago. 
She's amazing at what she does, and after 25 years of teaching in the classroom, she took the risk, without administration experience, she took the risk to apply for the new principal's position that was opening up at our school last year. She ended up winning that position. And in her very first talk with staff, the very first thing she said was, I'm here to liberate greatness in all of you. Now I know Marina, I've seen her teach, she's amazing, and I knew she, she meant that. The vision that she has for education is, is unreal. And when, I'm, when I think of uh, Marina's quote, I'm always drawn back to this wonderful network of educators that stands before me. And I would argue that not only are you liberating greatness within yourself and your students, you're also liberating greatness in one another. And collectively, as a whole, we are liberating greatness for our subject area, which is a powerful force as we push PE forward into its rightful place, which is at the core of any curriculum being taught in any school in any country of the world. And as you look around, I think you should feel a tremendous sense of pride, of commitment, and connection to our profession. So just one last little stretch before you sit down. I just want to shift gears over to the importance of clarifying our purpose as, as educators. And I believe that our pursuit of excellence in education can be profoundly impacted by clarifying and defining our purpose. And bearing that in mind, I want to share a very personal story with you. It's kind of an intense emotional experience, but it uh, truly helped me to clarify and define what I believe to be my purpose. And I consider it a gift. I want you to imagine a gift and visualize it in your head. It's not that big, maybe the size of a silver dollar. But before finding out what's inside, I want to tell you it's going to do amazing things for you. It's going to help you redefine what's most important in your life and move you in ways you've never been moved. It's going to help you gain a clearer vision of your purpose and your potential. It's going to help you expand your network, connect with new people, and form friendships that will last a lifetime. You will realize more than ever what family means to you and how much you love them. You will live a, ba a more balanced lifestyle and be more balanced in body, mind, and spirit. You will feel inspired, you will feel challenged, and you will want to make a difference. This gift came to me on May 6, 2011, while living in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, and it almost killed me. I call it my Shazam lightning bolt moment. And the permanent scars and injuries to my left wrist will be with me forever. Every time I look down at them, I'm reminded of my Shazam lightning bolt moment and the importance of it in helping me to clarify my own purpose. The sound of shattering glass will be with me forever. As my hand plunged through the glass, my instinctive reaction was to yank it out as hard as I could. And when I did this, the broken shards of razor-sharp glass completely severed the ulnar artery in my left wrist, along with all of the nerves, muscles, and tendons. I had a gaping wound that was essentially cut right down to the bone. And I knew that it was a serious arterial injury because blood had squirted out and almost splashed the driver of the bus. 20 seconds before, a bus had backed into a group of students at an international soccer tournament in a crowded parking lot. Fortunately, fortunately, none of them were injured. But as any good teacher would do, sensing imminent danger, I ran up beside the bus and I smacked the door of the bus to get the driver's attention. He ignored my call to stop and kept backing up, so that's when I smacked it a second time. The problem was that the, the glass was not proper safety glass, it was more like wine glass. So when I smacked it the second time, that's when my hand went through. Having been trained in first aid, I knew I had to stay calm. So I kind of fumbled about and grabbed onto my wrist and held it as high above my head as I could. And with blood pouring down all over my head and body, I couldn't help but think to myself, 
wow, I can't believe this is it. Right here, right now in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, this can't be it. I've got two beautiful boys, Eli and Ty, and my lovely Neela. They were all that I could think about as I went in search for help. And the first person that came to me was the secondary principal of the school, uh, and trying to remain calm. He was trying to show that he was calm, but he was definitely panicking. He led me into his office where I proceeded to spew blood all over his desk and the carpet and the couch. He called out for help, and together with the primary principal of the school, they organized for the, uh, the school's driver to, to rush me down to the local expat private clinic, which was about 45 minutes away in traffic. Neela was contacted and told to get down there. She was there when I arrived, and I was brought into the emergency room, and the doctor on duty was actually a friend that I played golf with. He had two kids in our school, and I told him, his name's Nick, and I said, Nick, this is, it's bad, it's terrible. I didn't even want to talk, I was trying to conserve energy. But he managed to pry my hand off my wrist, and when he did, blood squirted out all over his nicely pressed white button down. He yelled an obscenity that begins with F and ends in K. Please don't say that now. <laughs> This is being streamlined. He proceeded to put a tourniquet, uh, like a blood pressure gauge on my arm to act as a tourniquet, and told me that I needed to be medically evacuated as quickly as possible to Bangkok, Thailand, to be operated on by an orthopedic specialist. The problem was that we didn't have our passports. Our passports were being renewed at the Canadian Embassy in Bangkok, so leaving the country was not an option. He had a worried look on his face as he left the room, only to come back a few minutes later to tell me that the handful of qualified orthopedic surgeons in Phnom Penh were not there that morning. And local hospitals were not an option because they weren't equipped to handle such a procedure. So for the next three hours, clinic staff rushed around trying to figure out what to do. And every time the doctor came back in to check on me, the worried look on his face kind of said it all. The situation was really getting worse by the minute. By now, pain was radiating, intense pain was radi radiating up my arm and, and into my hand and wrist. My arm was turning kind of a darkish purple at this point. But in the, at the three-hour mark, he came back in to tell me that he had found a retired Scottish orthopedic surgeon that runs a charity that does volunteer surgeries on landmine victims. So you can imagine uh, how thankful I was that they found him. When Dr. James found out about the accident, he said, get him down here as quickly as possible. And the next thing I know, I was in the back of an ambulance that was weaving its way through the crowded streets of Phnom Penh for his clinic. And when it pulled up front, I saw this old-looking dude, dressed in scrubs, ready for surgery. And as the ambulance backed in, I could see that he had a big, bushy white beard. And I thought to myself, oh my God, Santa Claus is going to save my life. <laughs> my wife, Neela, was a, is a nurse, so she was allowed to scrub up and join me in the operating room. And she seriously, her face, her crying, was the last thing I remember when I was put out. I awoke a couple hours later to be told that the extent of damage to my wrist was too severe, that all the doctor could do was perform an arterial ligation, which is essentially to stitch up the loose artery on either side to stop the bleeding. And then he said that I needed to be um, taken to Bangkok for total reconstruction of my wrist and to reattach the artery. So three days later, the Canadian Embassy uh, issued emergency passports to us, and Neil and I flew into Bangkok where personnel from the embassy met us at the, as soon as we got off the plane. They gave us our temporary passports, we went through immigration and we went directly to the hospital where I was looked at by a team of orthopedic hand specialists. And they confirmed that I, I did need reconstructive surgery and scheduled in the procedure for the next morning. We arrived back the next morning only to be told that our school's health insurance had turned down payment for the very expensive procedure without reason. I was gutted 
was completely disappointed. So it was recommended by the doctors there that because the imminent danger had been taken care of with the arterial ligation, we had a few days. So they said, go back to Phnom Penh. Something's wrong with insurance. They need to cover this. Sort it out. Come back a few days later. So now we're at Bangkok Airport, and I'm sitting at the gate waiting for our flight back to Phnom Penh. And it was, it was here at this, this moment that I was in intense pain. My hand was kind of curled up. I was in a massive sling and bandaged up. And it was at this point that um, the anxiety of the injury was completely overwhelming to me. And I, I physically and emotionally broke down and completely lost it and started crying. However, men, PE teachers, <laughs> were not supposed to cry or show emotion. So I was quite ashamed of being in this state and people seeing me. So I got up and I walked to the far corner of the, the terminal. And although not religious, I prayed for the first time in many, many years. And I, I prayed for a sign that I was going to be OK, because all I could ask myself was, why, 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 why? I, I couldn't understand why this was happening to me. Well, call it divine intervention, chance, or coincidence, my prayers were answered in a number of ways. And I'm just going to tell you about one of those ways now. My wife was a nurse at the school that we worked at. And as a nurse, she got a lot of brochures from different charities around Cambodia and Asia that explain the work that they do. She had a quiet morning in her office this one morning. This was one week before the accident. So she had some time, and she was looking through the brochures, and she came across the amazing work of a selfless man running a charity. And she decided that she was going to donate. She was so moved by his work that she decided that she was going to donate $100 to his charity. One week later, it was the same doctor that saved my life. Can $100 save your, save your life? You bet your ass it can. At least that's the way I look at it. Two weeks later, this is a picture of, of a Canadian flag, but two weeks later, I had total reconstruction of my left wrist done, done by a top hand specialist in Singapore. And, it was at, and insurance admitted that they made a mistake, that they had screwed up, and they paid for the, the, the cost of the operation in full. And it was after the procedure that I went back to Canada, and I underwent three months of intensive, painful rehabilitation on my hand. And it was during this time that I seriously doubted whether or not I would ever be able to use my hand again. I had no feeling in it and no movement. I couldn't tie my shoe, couldn't do up my shirt. I'm physically active. I couldn't do any of the things that I love to do. So for three months, I couldn't do anything at all. And it was a really depressing time. However, the clouds started to part. And three months later, my family and I made the transition over to our amazing school in Nanjing, China. And despite still feeling down and depressed from the injury, you know, um, I kind of embraced, I absolutely embraced taking on this new challenge and this new role. And getting back to the students was allowing me to find my flow again. And it was at this moment, truly, that something began to shift inside of me, which is hard to explain. I think I came to the conclusion that teaching is one of the most noble professions that there is. And getting back to teaching was one of the best medicines that I needed to help overcome the emotional and physical pain from the injuries. I gave gratitude and thanks for having this new perspective. It was at this time that I began to, to blog, to reflect much more deeply on my blog about things that inspired me about teaching. And I made a conscious decision to blog more openly and honestly about my teaching practice without fear of being judged as right or wrong. I think it was definitely at this time that I came to the realization that who I was as a person was, was absolutely inseparable from who I was as an educator. 
I've filled several journals over the last few years with my reflections. So reflection has played a huge part in my learning journey. And it was during this time that I took every opportunity possible to connect with some amazing educators from around the world. And this is truly when my world began to, to open to me and multiple doors began to open which I simply walked through. My teaching took on a whole new meaning and continues to do so to this very day and this very moment. And looking back, I've come to the firm conclusion that my accident, my lightning bolt moment, truly allowed me to help, or allowed me to help my, uh, allowed me to clarify and define what I believe to be my purpose and my calling, which is not only to pursue excellence in my own profession, but to also inspire other educators to understand that they are the true difference makers in the time when the world and young people need them the most. I'm not implying that you need a near-death experience to find your calling or purpose. Don't go there. It's yucky, it's messy, and it hurts. However, I do believe with all of my heart and soul that your purpose is laid out before each and every one of you. And I promise you that if you reflect, if you're unclear about what that purpose is, that if you reflect on your, your life journeys, your personal journeys in life, I think that, and ask yourself, you know, why is it you do what you do? Think about who you're connected with. Think about where you work. And when you ask yourself those questions and answer them honestly, maybe perhaps your, your purpose will become more clear to you. And I believe that clarifying and defining our purpose will allow us to take more initiative and action in our own personal and professional lives and to be the best educators and coaches that we can be. Our subject area can and should be at the core of any curriculum because it's about critical thinking and collaboration. It's about personal, mental, physical, and social well-being. And it's about, most importantly, our pursuit of excellence, both personally and professionally. And just as Cliff Young ran his heart out in Melbourne, Australia, shuffling step by step towards the finish line over 30 years ago, I believe that we are also all shuffling forward towards our own personal finish lines, liberating greatness within ourselves and our students, liberating greatness in each other, and liberating greatness for our subject area. And I believe that purpose, autonomy, mastery, and mindset must be a part of this process. I hope that we can seize this moment and continue to pioneer our efforts forward. I want to leave you with one last thought. Yes, he's Canadian. Did you know that? Um, Jim Carrey gave an amazing commencement speech at a top business management school last year. It can be seen on YouTube. It's 26 minutes long, and it's well worth your time and effort to listen to the whole thing and to listen to his message. And there's one quote in particular that truly resonates with me and will stay with me forever. How will you serve the world? What do they need that your talents can provide? That's all you have to figure out. The effect that you have on others is the most valuable currency that there is. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Artie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Testing. Thank you, Andy. Thanks a lot. Done good. Take that water bottle. Okay. Um, Adam, would you mind coming to the stage? I know that another impromptu, and is Bill Bodie still here? Bill? Okay, why don't you come on down? Or Adam's going to do it? Okay. It is our privilege. Um, I'd like to um, introduce Adam Hall. He is the number one honcho for Team Fid... I can't even say it. <laughs> Team Fizz Phys Edagogy. 
Pedagogy plus Phys Ed. And Adam's going to give an overview of what we're about to do, which is the first, the world's first Ed Camp. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam. Okay. Thanks, Artie. Uh, just before we get started here, the Phys Ed Camp will be right here. It's, I heard a rumor today it was back at the hotel. It's not. It's here. And just to give you some of the timeline, uh, you'll have a little bit of a break, a little stretch break, get some fresh air. At 4.15, we will open up this pitch session. So at 4.15 back here, we will have some whiteboards set up. And if you would like to pitch a session, please come down and write the topic or the idea for the session into one of the squares in the quadrant that we have on the whiteboard. If there is something that you are interested in learning and you know someone who would be good at facilitating that session, find them, twist their arm a little bit and say, hey, would you consider pitching a session? Everything is organic. It's gonna be a little chaotic. I don't know how many people will be here, but we are going to build a little mini unconference and build the schedule in about 15 minutes. That's how long we'll take, and I will give you some more details then on what that will look like. But uh, think about if you would like to share, because everyone in here, you have something to share. And if there's something that you would like to share to your profession, your community, everyone who is here, consider doing it, and we will uh, set the schedule then and talk a little bit more about that. So 4.15 is when we're going to open up the pitch sessions at 4.30. If you're not interested in pitching a session, but you do want to attend, make sure you are here by 4.30 because we're going to get started with setting the uh, session board at that time. And we'll go from there, see what happens. Class dismissed.